Good morning, and uh, thank you very much for having me here, particularly um, for Stefan and his team for inviting me to uh, attend this symposium and share my thoughts on some uh, latest SDI preventative measures. This is my first time in Taiwan, um, and you know my experience so far has been very positive, but I think the biggest thing is not having to stay long enough for, uh, Thai, uh, for the Taiwanese pride. So, you know, a big mistake there. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about the evidence of some newer STI prevention strategies, in particular doxycycline post-exposure prophylaxis um, and the evidence behind that. Uh, we've also had some interesting data on meningococcal B vaccine for prevention of gonorrhea and really then bring everything together talking about the benefits and harms, but largely with a focus on antimicrobial resistance, which is a concern mainly amongst ID physicians, and the emerging guidance of doxypep, and then really just to summarize things uh, to touch on areas for future research and uncertainty. So let's just start with a case. You have a patient, uh, not all patients look like him, um, but you have JJ, a 28-year-old HIV positive gay man, attends his routine ID clinic, and he tells you he's had two syphilis reinfections and one urethral chlamydia infection since last seen. He's adherent to his antiretroviral therapy. His last viral load was undetectable a month ago. He's not in a regular relationship, and he has, on average, about six casual partners per month. He rarely uses condoms, and he has that relationship with his primary care doctor to be able to say that, because often that's very stigmatizing. And he's well informed about U equals U. He regularly screens for STIs, uh, including chlamydia and gonorrhea and syphilis, and he asks you about doxycycline PEP and if he would be a suitable candidate. The reality of, of this is that a lot of it is already happening in clinic, and a lot of patients are self-sourcing uh, doxycycline within the clinic. So really, uh, as healthcare professionals, we really need to be armed with uh, information and resources around this. And what clinicians, what clinicians most need and likely want a guidance and protocols around this. Sexually transmitted infections continue to increase globally, and this is the incident cases of four sexually transmitted infections. Uh, and if we home in in Southeast Asia, there were 60 million in 2021. There are problems, of course, with increasing sexually transmitted infections. We have gonorrhea, the problem of antimicrobial resistance, 76% resistant to tetracyclines in Malaysia. Syphilis, as we see more syphilis, we're also going to see more complications related to syphilis. So now we see, not, not too rarely, uh, ocular syphilis, uh, auditory syphilis, and neurosyphilis. And of course, the complications of chlamydia, particularly around women and their impact on pelvic inflammatory disease and fertility. But we also have seen LGV emerging as a proctitis uh, within MSM around the region. We also have to admit that condoms are not always preferred or feasible because it interrupts with sex, and we need newer interventions. And why not follow biomedical interventions in HIV? That seems to be a natural path to follow. And within the, the setting that we see now, certain uh, STIs disproportionately affect MSM. And this is data from the UK Health Security Agency. They provide very good data annually from sexual health clinics. You can find that, you can see that the graph on my right uh, essentially is that syphilis disproportionately affects men who have sex with men compared to other demographic populations. And within MSM, generally you have two problems in the UK. It's mainly gonorrhea and syphilis and then followed by chlamydia. And this pattern is not too dissimilar from countries like Malaysia and around the region. But having remembered that syphilis is the most easiest STI to screen compared to chlamydia and gonorrhea, because chlamydia and gonorrhea can be costly in some settings. So really, we need to move on from our traditional methods of trying to control the STI epidemic. Condoms have been around for donkey's years, okay? I mean, so long. But they haven't, we haven't really moved forward in terms of STI prevention, other than tried and tested counseling and behavioral change, uh, testing as frequent as possible, and then treating immediately, partner notification, vaccines for viral STIs, which are the room for improvement, and now more recently, antibiotic prophylaxis. 
So why use doxycycline as post-exposure prophylaxis? It's safe. It is well-tolerated. It is cheap. Three very good reasons. There's no known resistance to doxycycline in chlamydia and syphilis. Fantastic. But there is resistance in gonorrhea. For example, in US, it's about 20 to 25%. In France, it's about 65%. And as I mentioned, 76% uh, in Malaysia. And this is not a new strategy. We've used to be um, treating um, Lyme disease with doxycycline, uh, leptospirosis, and we use it fairly regularly in malaria prophylaxis. So just to throw in and start in, there are a number of uh, randomized controlled trials which have supported the efficacy of doxycycline post-exposure prophylaxis. Now, the doxycycline taken is 200 milligrams, so it's two tablets, and you take it once, uh, at least 24 hours, but up to 72 hours after sex. And they're supported by three randomized control trials, all in men who have sex with men. So the first one was IPAGAY. Uh, it was in 2015, 232 MSM on PrEP. The primary endpoint there was occurrence of first SDI, 47% reduction. Did this, this did not move on until about 2020, where in 2021, you had the findings of doxypep um, uh, released at uh, IS in Montreal, uh, which essentially showed an overall 65% reduction in men who have sex with men and transgendered women, both in the people living with HIV and in the PrEP cohort. And then more recently, you have the Doxivac trial, which is MSM on PrEP with a recent bacterial STI, an 84% reduction in the time to first episode of syphilis or chlamydia. Unfortunately, doxyprep study, the, the, the only doxyprep study findings released to date uh, in cisgender women have not revealed any efficacy. And we'll talk a bit about that a bit more. So doxypep, so a couple of studies uh, warrant further mention. This was doxypep, uh, once again, doxycycline, 200 milligrams taken within 72 hours after condomless sexual act. And there were two cohorts. There was a HIV positive cohort and the PrEP cohort. And they were randomized in a two to one fashion to either doxypep or no PEP. Now, if, if you look at the inclusion criteria a bit closely, they had to have one at least one STI in the past 12 months and had to have condomless sex with more than one male partner in the past 12 months. And this is the inclusion criteria that is now creeping into guidelines in terms of determining eligibility criteria for doxyprep um, uh, prescription. And what you find here essentially was a 65% reduction in overall STI incidence per quarter. And then if you looked at it across a different range of STIs, you find that the risk reduction is greatest in chlamydia, so up to 88% reduction in chlamydia, followed by syphilis, and less so on gonorrhea. And that largely depends, of course, on your gonorrhea resistance in that particular geographical region. Uh, second study is DOXIVAC. This was looking, this was a sub-study of a larger PrEP study called the ANRS Prevenes study. It was looking at men who have sex with men on PrEP for more than six months, and they had to have an, a bacterial STI in the prior 12 months. There were two arms, the doxypep or no pep, and also they were looking at a meningococcal vaccine arm, which has been shown to show some uh, protection against gonorrhea. The primary endpoint here was looking at the effect of doxypep on the first episode of syphilis or chlamydia when it came to the doxypep arm. And what you essentially find is that there was an 84% uh, reduction in the time to first incident chlamydia or syphilis with those who took doxypep. And if you looked at across a range of STIs, you find that once again, the greatest reduction is in chlamydia, followed by syphilis, uh, followed by gonorrhea, and also my mycoplasma genitalium. Studies in women, unfortunately, to date, have not been, um, uh, did not show any evidence of efficacy. And this was a study from Kenya, 449 women on PrEP uh, with a median age of 24 years. Similar way to take doxycycline. 
and they were tested for STIs every three months. The primary endpoint was essentially time to first incident infection, and as you can see uh, on the graph on the left, there were no differences between uh, the time to first incident STI, which was very disappointing and tends to mirror what's, what happened initially within in the PrEP trials of African women. Uh, so was it, is it a case of biological differences? Is it a case of suboptimal adherence? Reasonably high rates of STIs at baseline, 18%, with an annual STI incidence of 27%, but no difference uh, between the two arms. And the majority of infections were chlamydia. So once again, reinforcing the importance of uh, chlamydia testing in women in particular. So the question once again, now was it a pharmacokinetic issue? Was it a biological difference? Pharmacokinetic analysis did not reveal any differences in blood levels between men and women. And in fact, doxycycline concentrations peaked sooner in vaginal compared with rectal secretions. Um, and the concentrations were well above the minimal level which was required to inhibit chlamydia and syphilis. So this could not be a reason why it failed in women. So could it be resistance? Well, none, no chlamydia resistance was detected. Uh, all of the gonorrhea samples that were positive on culture were uh, uh, resistant to doxycycline, both at baseline and follow-up. So this could potentially explain why gonorrhea may not have been prevented, but not so much chlamydia. So mirroring once again in earlier PrEP trials, um, on, in terms of self-reported adherence, the women reported 78% coverage uh, of, uh, and, and high rates of self-reported adherence. But when you looked at it further, by analyzing drug on hair analysis, only 44% uh, assigned to the doxypep never had doxycycline detected. And only 29% of all quarterly visits had doxycycline detected. So there was this discrepancy or disconnect between what was reported and what was detected. Uh, in terms of drug level. And women, of course, face some vulnerabilities which men don't have, and this is social harms and verbal and physical violence, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, on the, for those women who take doxypep. So what are the potential harms of doxycycline post-exposure prophylaxis if we're thinking of at least starting this or implementing it? As mentioned, it's generally safe, it's well tolerated, it has high acceptability. There are side effects, but they're not uh, generally, uh, do not lead to discontinuation of the drugs. So the most common side effect are gastrointestinal. Uh, that you can get photosensitivity, and so this needs to be mentioned to the patient, and it can be managed fairly easily by asking patients to wear sunscreen or at least avoid the sun. And rarely you have this pill esophagitis, and even rare, more rarely, benign intracranial hypertension. Um, concerns are mainly around antimicrobial resistance in the long term and the effect on microbiome and whether these tests in fact impair syphilis, syphilis diagnostic. So moving on to antimicrobial resistance, and this is an area of interest particular amongst ID physicians. So this is data from doxypep and, this, and represents uh, data from those who had positive gonorrhea cultures with MIC results, so they're reporting the levels of resistance. So you on baseline, so right at the start, you had about 24% resistance to tetracycline. In the doxypep arm, this remains sort of relatively unchanged at about 27%, whereas in those who were in the standard of care arm, this reduced to 11%. So there's a suggestion that doxypep may be less protective against strains. Uh, with existing tetracycline resistance. But having said that, the sample size was very, very small because a lot of patients did not have culture data prior to uh, antibiotic treatment, which is the reality of what happens when you have moved to a, a PCR or NAT screening uh, gonorrhea screening. But what about the impact on other STIs? So what about in chlamydia? Well, no tetracycline resistance has been identified so far in humans to chlamydia. Some resistance has been described in pigs, and there are concerns whether this could transfer to humans. And then there are challenges in resistance testing. We can't grow chlamydia. It's very difficult to grow. And so if you want to determine resistance, you, there's a need for genomic testing. 
What about syphilis? Well, doxycycline is not the preferred treatment for syphilis. Penicillin is. But yet, after six decades of treatment, there's lack of penicillin and tetracycline resistance. But we have encountered resistance in other drugs, particularly azithromycin, from just a single point mutation. Uh, our colleagues in Singapore have already mentioned that um, uh, mycoplasma genitalium is a concern for them, uh, and one of the barriers in which they would not consider uh, considering rollout of doxypep. However, doxycycline is not very effective, essentially on its own. It's generally used as a, a part of a two-step therapy. There's already a huge amount of resistance to macrolides and fluoroquinolones, and clinical mycoplasma res resistance to tetracyclines have not yet been described. And then there's the issue with bystander uh, bugs, which, are, which can be affected by uh, greater use of doxycycline. And looking at an example of Staph aureus colonization, and this is once again data from doxypep, doxypep is associated with a reduction, a 14% reduction in Staph aureus colonization at about month 12, uh, and then subsequently, even though the resistance was low initially in both arms, there was an increase in resistance uh, by about 8% in the doxypep arm from baseline resistance. So there's some increase in resistance in other bystander organisms. Well, what about if you select gonorrhea, Neisseria gonorrhea resistant, which is resistant to tetracyclines or doxycyclines, will this then subsequently lead to resistance to other antimicrobials. And that, that is a concern, and a, a concern that is justified. But co-resistance with other antimicrobials is highest amongst isolates which are chromosomally encoded, uh, with chromosomally encoded resistance to tetracyclines, and less so plasmid encoded. And so we need to monitor this uh, with the rollout of doxypep uh, and the type of resistance patterns that occur. And how will doxycycline impact the microbiome? So what about your good gut bacteria? So well, short-term data, and this is depicted by um, some data on the right, looking at ESBL E. coli from the anal swabs, there was no difference in the doxypep arm and in the, in the arm that did not take pep. But this is in the short term. What we're interested is in long-term data. Uh, and it may be a bit fairer to compare uh, doxypep versus uh, intermittent use of doxycycline or keftroxone or other antimicrobials rather than just doxypep or no pep. Uh, because inadvertently, people who get STIs will have to receive this treatment. And how do you counsel patients also can be quite problematic around the effect of antibiotics on the microbiome. So we need to be, so, so this putting everything together, we need to understand that yes, there are concerns about resistance, but doxypep is not going to be the only source of doxycycline exposure. There are other sources. Um, so far, CT and syphilis resistance is not a concern, but we need to monitor this and be aware of bystander bacteria resistance. So this is some work done from Australian colleagues and has been depicted in many presentations looking at if you were to start giving out doxycycline, which groups of people would likely gain the most benefit out of um, being offered doxycycline? And this is data from about 10,000 patients in a US-based sexual health center called the Fenway in Boston. And essentially what you can see now, the blue part of the chart depicts the proportion of individuals prescribed doxypep. Uh, the orange bit reflects the proportion of all STI diagnoses averted whilst they're on doxypep. And so if you were to prescribe everybody doxypep, you would avert within that clinic, which is mainly a, an MSM gender diverse and transgender cohort, you were, would avert 71% of all STI diagnoses, but you would need to treat the numbers needed to treat would be fairly high at 3.9. What you can see as you go down, uh, the more efficient strategy essentially would be to prescribe PEP based on STI history, particularly if you had a syphilis diagnosis, if you had two STIs in the past 12 months or in the past six months. Uh, these would this, this would result in a lower number numbers that you require to treat.
tree to achieve the same level of efficiency. And similar once again to PEP, uh, findings, qualitative findings from DOXYPEP trials report more sexual pleasure and peace of mind. Uh, they're viewed as being proactive and responsible about their own sexual health. Uh, they can, they're aware of the antimicrobial resistance, but it's not a barrier to the most. So what do guidelines say? And the emerging guidelines which support uh, the implementation of DOXYPEP, remembering once again that clinicians are always guided by guidelines and protocols and generally do not move forward if, the, if you don't have this. Well, in San Francisco was one of the first places to roll out these guidelines um, and then followed by subsequent uh, places in uh, Atlanta, uh, Seattle as well. Now, in terms of the patient population that they have recommended doxypep is either to cis men and trans women who have had a bacterial STI in the past year and reported condomless or oral uh, sexual contact with more than one cis male or trans female partner in the past year. There, sh there should be some shared decision making. So even if they don't report having had a history of STI, but a number of sexual partners, they should be considered for doxycycline post-exposure prophylaxis. The CDC guidelines recently received their draft, uh, recently posted their draft uh, guidelines online in October 2023 for the public to comment, and that's a QR code on the right, which you can access the, the guidelines. Uh, once again, very similar, they have also used gay and bisexual men and transgender women who've had at least one bacterial STI in the last 12 months. They also talk about how to use PrEP and what monitoring that's required to be used on PrEP. So that's come out a bit differently, but I think of all the, the guidelines, one of the most comprehensive consensus statements have been uh, those released by the Australian Society. Um, you can't really see that, I'm sorry. And these are recommendations for community and clinicians. They also have recommendations for uh, research and policy as well. So it's very comprehensive, and I urge you to have a look at that. What they have prioritized is, once again, gay and bisexual men, unsurprisingly. But what they also have prioritized is a recent syphilis diagnosis above chlamydia and gonorrhea. Chlamydia and gonorrhea can be considered but syphilis is a priority in their uh, consensus statement. Um, you need, to, they, they, they like PrEP, what they've suggested is that you use it for a predefined period of time and then you reassess the situation after three to six months to see if there's an ongoing risk. They also um, suggest that you should try and maximize the benefits of doxypep while minimizing overall antibiotic use, which essentially means so if you, for example, a chemsex user and you're having sex over the weekend multiple times, rather than having it after each episode, maybe the best thing to do is just to have it on Monday uh, rather than having it on Saturday and Sunday. So you're minimizing antibiotic exposure with, um, uh, with, with overall exposure. If you are to prescribe and to take doxypep, it's important that you get screened regularly, so every three to four months uh, at least. Uh, and it's important to take cultures to monitor gonorrhea uh, resistance and assess your HIV risk with PrEP. Uh, and, and discussions need to take place about antimicrobial resistance. The other guidelines, the BASH guidelines are a bit more conservative. It is waiting an update, but there are concerns in, that have been mentioned around uh, antimicrobial resistance. I suspect this will change as more and more guidelines emerge. EACS recently also released their guidelines it should be on a case-by-case -case basis in MSM with repeated STIs. And these counseling tools that you get are important if you're thinking about setting it up, uh, particularly from a community-based organization. Uh, these are fact sheets and simple uh, uh, information around uh, 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 how you should take it, what should you do if you, miss, uh, uh, if you, if you have sex again, uh, and, and what what are the areas of uncertainty around doxypep? And the reality of it is whether you agree with it or you disagree with it, it's already happening. So whether you want to come on board, you at least need to re realize that the MSM community are very engaged, they're very aware of the latest research, and are probably self-sourcing this anyway. And so this is important to at least know what is happening uh, within the guidelines field. This is a slide from, taken from IAS and EAC and uh, by, by Jean-Michel Molina, really summarizing how to use Dr. Pep. 
to the population, men who have sex with men, transgender women, living with or without HIV, uh, for those who are having sex without condoms and have had a one to two STIs in the last 12 months. Important to make sure you test negative for chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis at least seven days before starting PrEP. Um, you use 200 milligrams of doxycycline, ideally with plenty of water, uh, and taken 24 hours, but not more than 72 hours after sex. Screen for STIs every three months, uh, assess safety regularly. They've suggested no baseline labs, but consider annual testing with renal function tests, liver function tests, and CBC, and perform test of cure if an STI is diagnosed, particularly when doxycycline is used. The doxycycline prep field is coming. Uh, there's only been one randomized control trial data so far. It's been a very small study and largely a feasibility study, and it does show that it does work, um, but you need, it needs to be explored in a larger randomized control trial, one of which is happening currently in Canada. A lot of lessons to be learned from the PrEP field when we think about DOXY-PEP implementation. Guidelines, guidelines, guidelines for clinicians. Don't limit it to clinic uh, because you over-medicalize uh, uh, an STI prevention strategy. And particularly around PrEP, they were very concerned around antiviral resistance and renal toxicity, which turned out to be very, which turned out to be rare. The bigger ch challenge was keeping patients on PrEP. Important to continue the positive messaging around PrEP as well as STI prevention strategies uh, in a way that it improves your sense of well-being and intimacy. But yet there are many unanswered questions with respect to DoxyPEP. So how should STI exposures be addressed among people to doc taking doxycycline PEP? So if, you ha if you're a contact of syphilis or chlamydia and you're taking doxypep, what do you do then? Will doxycycline PEP prevent STIs among cisgender women and other populations not included in trials? What will the evidence be for doxycycline PrEP compared to doxycycline PEP? How can we make it more equitable? And of course, as mentioned before, the effect on the microbiome and uh, resistance in the long term and on other STIs. Now, very briefly, but I won't talk too much on this. This is the last two slides. There's been some evidence of a uh, meningococcal vaccine uh, conferring protection in terms of preventing gonorrhea. And this has been shown uh, in countries where you have scale up of meningococcal group B vaccines, particularly around Canada, New Zealand, and Cuba. And this was investigated in the DOXYVAC trial. Uh, and initial results were very, very promising, showing a 51% reduction in time to first gonorrhea infection in the arm that was given uh, the meningococcal B vaccine. However, um, the final analysis of this finding suggests not support the interim results, and we await the final analysis of this. In the meantime, it's being investigated in other clinical trials in Australia, as well as in the US and Thailand, uh, and, 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 and we await the final analyses of these trials. So in summary, um, there are new strategies to prevent syphilis and other STIs are needed. Uh, we, we can, we've seen that doxycycline post-exposure prophylaxis shows strong, consistent reduction of bacterial STIs particularly around syphilis and chlamydia, among men who have sex with men and transgender women. The impact of doxycycline PEP on gonorrhea is likely to be limited, particularly in settings of high GC resistance. And the benefit of doxycycline PEP for other populations is currently uncertain. We are concerned and we will continue to monitor antimicrobial resistance, but I believe it is time for cautious doxycycline implementation with prioritization for those who are at highest risk of STIs, but particularly those who keep on coming with repeated STIs, we need to at least think outside the box. And finally, the final analysis and future studies of meningitis B vaccines for the prevention of gonorrhea are waiting. Thank you very much. That's my team in University of Malaya.